Good morning, party people, and welcome to the northernmost town in the world, Hammerfest, Norway. The cruise ship's just pulling into it. So over the next few minutes, you'll see a, a shifting background here as I uh, give you a little spiel of office hours, office hours questions. Uh, so let's go through your, t oh, and I should say too, it's, uh, the wind is a little chilly. I don't think I've filmed a video up here on the top deck uh, before. But if it wasn't for the wind, I could totally just be up here in a t-shirt and sweater. It's, uh, I've been really lucky with the temperature this week. I have not been so lucky with the sun. It hasn't been very bright. It's been pretty gray. Uh, I guess probably in retrospect, September wasn't the best time to do a cruise up the coast of Norway to Russia, but uh, I should have done it during the summer. But it tied in really well with Data Saturday, uh, Oslo and Gothenburg. So let's see here, your top voted question. Oh, I should have started the recorder. Let me do that real quick. Top voted question is from Axel who asks, how do I explain the situation where my newly created index makes a query plan more optimal, but the index isn't used in the execution plan? If I use the SPBlitz index command, then the index usage is zero. I can see the new index name in the execution plan's XML, though, under optimizer stats usage. Well, you just explained it yourself, man. SQL Server didn't use the index to pull data, but SQL Server used the statistics created by the index in order to better understand the distribution of data which helped it build a better execution plan. So then at that point, if you wanted to, you could just go create that statistic instead and drop the index. You can manually create statistics in SQL Server. It's fairly unusual. Uh, it doesn't get people across the finish line very often, but you've hit a case where it would, where that uh, uh, stat will help you get a better execution plan. Now, at the same time, I should also say though, what you might have done is you might have just used the create index command from Clippy that shows up in your execution plan saying, hey, you should create an index on these columns. Clippy's index recommendations are just in comma delimited order. Uh, they're not in any kind of order that makes sense for performance tuning. So you may need to reorder those and you may find that suddenly SQL Server uh, does use that index. Next up, Icebergo asks, Icebergo, Icebergo asks, SP Blitz is warning my friend that he has 46,000 plans in the cache. SP Blitz cache is warning him about 160,000 plans. Why are those two numbers different? Well, Icebergo, you're about to learn an important lesson about how open source works. See, the reason why they call it open source is you can click file open and find the source of where those things are coming from. That's not really why they call it open source. You can read the scripts and then that way you can see exactly what queries are used to generate those numbers. And that's one of the ways that you can learn. Maybe you can't learn, but I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt start there. Next up we have Rollback is Single Threaded asks, Hi Brent, I've run out of ideas to blog about about SQL Server. How can I proceed? So this has hit me a couple times in my life where I've uh, my blog queue has run dry and I've had to think, okay, I, I don't know what I should write about. So I'm going to give you several things, several ways to approach it. One is to look where people post questions, because wherever people post questions, odds are they're not finding a good answer for that question. These questions at office hours are a great example. You might think, well, Brent covered that answer. Half the time I don't. Half the time, like that example I just used there uh, in the last question, I said to the person, go open up the source code and you can see for yourself. Um, another uh, place where questions are posted is dba.stackexchange.com, stackoverflow.com, sqlserversentral.com. 
Another thing that you can do is open up your help desk tickets or uh, JIRA issues, whatever you use to track your work from say a year ago. Start going through the things that you worked on a year ago and say, what took me a while in order to solve? Or what can I just blog about and go here, here's how you solve that particular problem. It doesn't sound glamorous or sexy to you now, but at the time, a year ago, when you were working on it, you probably wish you had some kind of quick, here, easy reference for, if I need to do this, how do I go about doing it? Um, another thing that you can think about is, is your blog is also for your resume. You're tracking the kinds of things that you do. Um, so you can write about here are the kinds of things that I do during my day job. Here are the, the uh, kinds of challenges that I tackled this week. Um, so that when you go back later and an employer wants to see the kind of work that you were doing, they have a better idea. Next up we have Richard who asks, did you see any shipwrecked children at the Blue Lagoon? I don't think I saw any kids at the Blue Lagoon the last time I was there. I don't think I did. I, I'm pretty sure they allow kids. I don't, I just didn't see them though. That's weird. Oh, well, you know, some of it might be because this is school season now. Like I was in uh, late August, early September. Um, so it, it uh, school was back in session and kids probably don't want to miss the first like month of school. So that's probably what it was. Junior, not yet DBA says, hi Brent, my old dev colleague created a clustered index of a CARE 30 starting with five initials for, with the app's username like Brent12345. With millions of rows, should we expect performance problems? I would rather use a sequential ID. I would rather you use a sequential ID as well. However, changing the clustered index of a table can be kind of invasive. It can require a lot of changes and it's probably not your biggest bang for the buck. Is it causing problems? Yeah, but the number of problems that it's creating and the, the volume of noise is so low compared, <coughs> excuse me, compared to everything else that's going on in the SQL Server, I wouldn't put that at the top of your radar. What I would say though is whenever you create a new table from scratch, you are right to say you should probably use an identity column instead. Uh, next up, let's see here. Um, Berglund says, I got Microsoft SQL Assessment API telling me to disable automatically manage page file sizes for all drives. Yeah, I, I agree with that. You don't really want a big ginormous page file uh, for SQL Server, because after all, if you run out of memory on a SQL Server and you start sw uh, swapping to disk, you got some pretty big uh, problems. What I would do instead is set the page file to be the minimum size required for a mini dump. And I talk about how to do that in the KB articles to do it uh, in our SQL Server setup guide. If you go to brentozar.com and click scripts up at the top, uh, there is a downloadable first responder kit with a setup guide in there. And I tell you how to set the uh, page file size inside there. And it lines up with what Microsoft recommends. Bill says, can you create and manipulate temp tables and queries when you're on a read-only secondary? Bill, I admire you. In fact, I think you win an award on this session. You win the award for the laziest person possible. Most of the people out there in the world, everywhere out there, when they think about doing something, especially if it's something as simple as creating a temp table, they might actually just go try it. But Bill, you're the weirdest kind of person and that you work really hard at being lazy. You didn't just want to say create temp table while you're sitting in front of management studio. You wanted to go open up a website, type in a question that would take some time, wait until a Microsoft certified master answered it for you, and then read that answer or watch the answer be displayed. So I've got great news for you. You're today's winner and I'll give you the answer. The answer is yes. Yes, you can do that. Now, Bill, most people would have found that out in a matter of seconds, but Bill, hardworking, 
Here's to you, my friend. Next up, Spike says, what is the better cloud environment for running SQL Server VMs and why, AWS or Azure? I, you know, so it's an interesting question. The thing is, we don't get to pick cloud providers, you and me. We don't get to pick cloud providers based on what we want for one particular application. There are all kinds of applications that your company is running. There are all kinds of considerations for things like licensing and contracts and sales relationships. So I don't get into which specific provider is better for VMs for SQL Server. What I will say is, let's look five or 10 years down the road. Five or 10 years down the road, are your applications still going to be hosting their data in SQL Server VMs? I bet not. And that's gonna freak out some of the people who watch this. I bet that if you're going to the cloud, within the next five or 10 years, you're going to be in platform as a service. You're going to be in Azure SQL DB, maybe you're in Azure SQL DB Managed Instances, or Amazon RDS. So that's what I would probably compare instead, instead of the small VM technologies that will leapfrog each other across the span of the next few years. What you really want to know is which platform as a service is going to be better for you five or 10 years from now. And if your organization is still planning to use Microsoft SQL Server, then I think the answer is going to be Azure SQL DB managed instances. I don't think that it's much better than Amazon RDS today. In fact, there are plenty of ways where it's worse. There are some ways where it's better. Uh, but I think five or 10 years from now, that's probably the place where I would bet on. Um, notice that I did qualify it with, if you're gonna be in SQL Server, a lot of shops that I know are saying the next time we do a rewrite of our application, we're gonna blow up and think of all kinds of different possible data storage. Uh, maybe it's gonna be SQL Server, maybe it's gonna be Postgres, maybe it's gonna be DynamoDB, and then that really blows open the playing field. Next up, AI says, my original question got garbled in the middle. It should read, should we start with AI as a concept fundamentals, or should we take an AI for DBAs approach, e.g. what data types are used for AI data? Okay, so I'm gonna give you the same answer I gave you last time. AI is not a fundamentally different consumer of databases. AI is an app. AI is gonna write queries. AI is gonna fetch data. There is no AI data type. AI is just an app. So you should approach it, and it, granted it's lots of different apps, it's way, different ways of thinking about apps, but when it comes to the database, it's just an app. So the way that you should approach it is, imagine that your developers decided to use a different uh, coding language. Imagine that they decided to use uh, C Sharp for the first time, or they decided to transition everything over to Java. Uh, that how would that change the way that you work as a DBA? It probably wouldn't. Don't ask that question again. Listen to the answer. <laughs> B. Squidward says, at some point you had discussed your favorite cruise lines, but I can't find the video. Do you mind going over your thoughts on cruise lines again? Seeing how much fun you have on your trips is making me finally want to use my uh, paid time off. <laughs> um, short answer is, uh, uh, Herta Gruten, I'm not going to include this line because this is kind of a different cruise line. Um, the, the first places that you should go with your first cruise, Carnival is cheap. It's like the Walmart of cruise lines. Being on a, a Carnival cruise is exactly like going to Walmart. Go step through the aisles of Walmart if that's what you want your vacation to be like in order to save some money. Carnival is the cruise line for you. It's not for me. Norwegian uh, and uh, Royal Caribbean tend to be for fairly active families, but uh, active younger people, uh, lots of games and things going on on the cruise ship, but not as loud and crazy as Walmart. Um, and they're still reasonably priced. Um, 
princess skews older. Princess folks tend to be in their like 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, quieter cruise ships, less kids, less loud and crazy games. Um, and then celebrity is kind of a, which kind of, you might guess by the name, it's kind of a more wealthy cruise line. Really cool art. I love the modern art on celebrity ships and I love the uh, food choices. The food's really good on celebrity, even on the buffets. Um, so there's your quick rundown. If I, if I had to say to somebody taking their first cruise, I'd probably start with Norwegian or Royal Caribbean because they're pretty, uh, pretty fun and friendly. And we'll do one more. Let's see here. Uh, TJ asks, what's your current thinking on whether SQL Server 2022 is ready for production use? I really should have read this question first. Uh, standard edition, single server, no HA and DR. Has your thinking changed since the CU de CU4 debacle where queries were returning incorrect sorted results? Um, CU5 and CU6 are still trying to fix issues with parameter sensitive plan optimization, crashing uh, SQL Server every 15 minutes, doing memory dumps. Um, I, the, the question I would ask is, what do you want to use SQL Server 2022 for? What is it in there that you're not getting from SQL Server 2019? And then when you come to that list, when you make a list of features, because if your answer is, well, it's newer, it must be better, you're going to be in for a rocky road. Make a list of the specific features that you want, and then go read their notes. Go figure out whether or not they work. For example, if you're using managed instance link, I don't think that that's ready yet. If you're using it for um, to sync data to Azure Synapse Analytics, given all the hubbub about Fabric, you may not even want to go to Azure Synapse Analytics anytime soon. Um, so that go find out what you're using it for, and then that may influence whether or not you even want to ask the question. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, of uh, installing SQL Server as few times as possible and getting the longest support life possible. SQL Server 2019 support life is still pretty good right now. Um, so yeah, I, I think I would still tend to go to 2019 first. God, I'm going to get in trouble for that. I know I'm going to get in trouble for that. It is what it is. That's why I have run to the northernmost corners of Norway to escape from Microsoft people. That's not true. Um, and generally, I mean, I give Microsoft a ton of crap as a company. Um, at all of the individuals that I know, and I'm, I'm generalizing, but it really is true. All of the individuals I know who work for Microsoft are freaking smart, are brilliant. Um, some can be a little overly passionate and tie their self-worth to the company that they work for uh, and take things really, really personally, but they're, they're freaking brilliant people. I mean, they, Microsoft doesn't hire a lot of morons. I've, I don't think I've ever interacted with one. Um, so they're good people, but just as a company, uh, the vision, okay, so no, I, I will take that back. There are people in sales and marketing who can't find their butts with both hands. Uh, but on the technical side, they're, they're brilliant people. It's just that the technical people don't make the decisions about uh, when the release date is and when the thing is ready to ship. It seems like those decisions are driven by sales and marketing people who, again, not all of them, but many of them can't find their butt with both hands. All right, so here we are in Hammerfest, the uh, northernmost town in uh, 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 all of, I guess, civilization, I suppose. Uh, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna spin the camera around a little bit here so that you can see um, there are other parts of it over there. We'll zoom in a little bit just so that you can see. There's a very boring, dry morning, or bo boring, uh, uh, gray morning over here in uh, Hammerfest. Um, so uh, today I will be heading, uh, really just riding up the uh, west coast, or north coast of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that's what happens when I try to work a camera. <coughs> oh, goodness. Work a camera and talk at the same time. I'm heading across the north coast of uh, um, Norway towards uh, Russia, towards the Russian border. 
and then uh, tomorrow morning we get into the uh, town of Kirkenes, right up against the Russian border, and that's where I get off the ship, and the ship starts heading back down the side of uh, Norway again. So uh, yeah, I fly out from Kirkenes tomorrow, start making my way back to the United States. I think I have four flights in all in order to get home. I am right in the middle of nowhere but when it comes up to Kirkenes. Um, it's either three or four flights. I think it's four flights. Um, had a great time, really enjoyed it. I, I really enjoy uh, getting back to in-person conferences. And I uh, uh, still struggle with when is the right time to start doing in-person training classes again, if ever. Like, would there ever be a time where I would teach mastering index tuning in downtown Chicago or in Las Vegas? I don't know what the answer is. Um, I, I love being in front of people, but I don't know how many other people are willing to pay to get out because I know a lot of people uh, from talking to their companies the companies aren't willing to pay for in-person training because the companies say to the to their employees hey look you said that remote was good enough for you when it came to remote working well then it must be good enough for you when it comes to training as well and the employees are like you got me there um, so I, I don't know I think that the size of the market might have dropped so much that I don't know that it makes sense anymore and I'm struggling trying to come up with that answer too because we're coming up on my annual Black Friday sale and the annual Black Friday sale is when I put all kinds of I usually do launches and things like that and I just don't think that 2024 is going to be the year yet for in-person classes yet they, I, the conferences are slowly coming back up to speed. We got uh, SQL Bits is, uh, is coming out with their dates and location. Um, the PASS Summit is coming up in a couple of months out in Seattle. Uh, but the attendance on those events has still been hit or miss. I think SQL Bits did really well last year, but the summit didn't do as well. These local events I've been to haven't done as well as they've done in years past. Um, so I, I just don't know. I don't think that 2024 is going to be the year for in-person classes yet. And it's fun to see the, the behind the scenes decision making process for y'all probably too as well. All right, well, I am going to, I was going to say get some breakfast. No, breakfast still isn't served yet. It's only 5.20 in the morning. Goodness gracious. So I am going to go get some coffee and wait for the breakfast to open up. So I will see y'all on the next Office Hours. Adios.